We are starting this session of this international seminar, Venezuelan struggles. As we promised since 2020, we are starting the second phase of the seminar, a seminar focused on what is going on in Venezuela. It has been demonized or the invisibilized from international media networks. This seminar allows us to have a first-hand uh, view what is going on in Venezuela and in first person from organizations, movements, communes, activists, building the Bolivar Revolution on a daily basis. As defined by the name of this seminar, we want to see Venezuela as a process of struggle for revolution, a process of a struggle against colonization and the building of an alternative society. We thank all the organizations taking part in this activity. We thank our the, uh, friends from the Lignam University, the, the Eco-Technological Greenhouse Center, and also the Simon Bolivar Institute. Venezuela is giving a lot of support to this activity and to the ALBA movement platform. Today, in this uh, 13th session, we will be speaking, as we saw in the ads, on Ezequiel Zamora, the popular rebellion led by Ezequiel Zamora, that whose anniversary was celebrated in February of uh, its, his uh, assassination. I'm not going to provide much detail about Zamora. However, I just want to introduce this debate showing this book. This is the blue book. It is a document built in the 90s in a collective fashion within the Revolutionary Movement 200. This movement was the grouping of civilian and military forces that organized in Venezuela in order to conduct a revolution and to change Venezuela, that during the half, second half of the 20th century was governed by a pact of elites, a pact organized between the US government and the two main right-wing factions in the country. From then on, four decades of uh, disguised dictatorship happened. And during that period, this movement 200 uh, developed under the guidance of Chavez. Here, we have the the documents of discussion of that movement. At the end of the 80s, with the end of the uh, Berlin Wall, the reading from Venezuela is that the capitalism was in crisis, that the capitalist hegemony was in crisis, but also the left-wing processes were also in a crisis, although also regionally. There was a loss of uh, the path and goals, therefore, Chavez proposed the need to rebuild the ideological basis for the revolutionary process in Venezuela. He proposed in this book, the blue book, the ideological basis predicated on three roots. These roots are emblematic figures that occurred 200 years, like Simon Bolivar, a general strategist, but also the role of Simon Rodriguez, also known as Robinson, as a guide, as a theoretical guide. And also the third route was Ezequiel Zamora as the general of the people. And uh, 
land and free people is the slogan of Samora. I'm not going to develop any further the figure of Samora, but just give you the context. So what has been happening in Venezuela of the last 20 years has a lot to do with these three ideological roots that have been intertwined in the historical struggles in Venezuela, in the region and worldwide. With this context, I'm going to give the floor to our the speaker, Ali Ramon Rojas Olaya, university professor of the Santa Rosa University, historian. He's part of the, the system of uh, training insurgent Caracas. So without further ado, and thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Rojas, we give him the floor. Thank you, Hernan, for this kind invitation. And thank you for giving us this framework of uh, the role of Zamora within the Venezuelan revolution. Today, we're going to talk about the rebellion conducted by uh, Zamora, a uh, revolutionary guide. Zamora, together with Simon Bolivar and Simon Rodriguez, is one of the three roots of the Bolivarian revolution. He was born in a small town in Miranda State, Cuba, February, on February the, the 1st, 1817, when, he, when Rodriguez was 47 years old and Bolivar 33. Venezuela was raised by the bloody struggle for independence. His father, Alejandro Zamora, fought alongside the liberator and he died in 1820. And his mother is teacher Paula Correa. And she organized women in order to support the patriot cause. On the birth of Zamora, Hugo Chavez, commander said the following. Zamora was born there, in this place, in the Valles del Tuy, that was the forced passage of troops, peoples, travelers, and of news coming from the center part of the country towards the east and the plains of the center part. He was only two years old when Bolivar launched the speech of uh, Angostura and uh, when the Third Republic was born. He was raised listening to the news of the triumph of the revolution. He was four years old when in Carabobo, the army and the people concentrated in Carabobo led by the genius, liberating genius of Simon Bolivar in 1821. That led to the great victory to the Venezuelan people in Carabobo in June 24th, where Colombia is politically born. Please, we can continue moving forward to see the map of uh, the Bolivia, of the Colombian map, which is the utopia of Bolivar, and uh, also uh, the struggle of uh, Zamora. So there you see the Cua town beneath Caracas. And it is there that uh, Zamora was born. The next slide, please. So the next, the next, please. Here, we see this map depicting the Republic of Colombia created by Simon Bolivar. This 
Republic is born on December the 17th, 1819 in Angostura. And it represents the union of uh, Venezuela and New Nueva Granada, and that will become the unity of uh, Latin America. Then we have Quito and Guayaquil that join afterwards. So you can see how big that country was. We had um, the, the coastline of Nicaragua, the Essequibo was part of our country, the Galapagos Islands, part of uh, Brazil and Peru. That was a vast nation, larger than the US at that time. So Hugo Chavez goes on telling us about Bo Zamora. He was 13 years old when he learned that uh, Marshal Sucre was assassinated in Berruecos, Colombia, and he was about to become 14 years old when certainly he learned together with the rest of the people and the youth of the passing of Bolivar in Santa Marta and the treason of the revolution of independence. Therefore, that little boy was born among the poor, the peasants, the campesinos, expecting for justice. You can continue, please. Next. So here, Chavez goes on telling us that that child felt at the heat of his home, his people of the town of Tui and the towns of the center part of the country. He was uh, filled with the hope, the hope people had in 19, 19, 18, 19, 18, 21, 18, 24, with the triumph in the Battle of Ayacucho. It was also filled with the despair, the same despair that filled the Venezuelan people after the passing of Sucre and Bolivar and the, the fracture of the unitary dream of the Republic of Colombia. Let's now see a slide when we see the face of a lady. She is Paula Correa. She's the mother of Ezequiel Zamora. And uh, his father, Alejandro Zamora, died in 1821. Four years later, in 1825, uh, Paula Correa, the widower, came to Caracas with the children. In the capital, Ezequiel was only eight years old. He registered to learn with, master, with teacher Vicente Mendes. That school was located in the municipal house of the corner of Las Mercedes in Caracas. Let's move forward. Let's continue with the next slide. Women play a major role in revolution, historically. Historiography ignored women for a long time Likewise, the participation of indigenous people and Afro-descendant people in the, the independent, independentist revolution. Prior to the, the Santa Ines battle, the, the Zamoras 
Bolivarian forces go to Barinas. They were led by the Pedro Ramos, a uh, member of the oligarchy, and uh, the power was in the hands of the puppet Julian Castro. In that day, the peasant blood was so boiling. They needed a transformation. Zamora planned an ingenious system of the trenches that offered uh, some resistance to the conservative soldiers. The soldiers thought that they will, the victory will be easy, but in the end, they will be falling in a mortal trap in Santa Ines. Prior to December the 10th, the, those days were days of devastation. The enemies of the homeland were pillaging, burning houses, raping women, and murdering men. Juan Yari, an old guy who knew very well the geographical region, and was known as the map of Barinas, um, he was there and they, he wanted to use him to lead to Zamora. So there we have uh, these images we see have been painted uh, uh, by the artists of the people. And uh, the, the painting you see there uh, is on the book of Brito Figueroa, one great historian, important intellectual of the second half of the 20th century. He made major contributions to the insurgent history. So please move forward with the next slide. On December the 10th, 1859, Ezequiel Zamora defeated the enemy. The methods he used in the Santa Ines battle, as I already mentioned, was uh, the guerrilla warfare with an army of campesinos. That is why he used to wear on, on top of the straw hat, the kepi, which is the symbol of the unity between the civilians and the military. And it is precisely what motivates Chavez to unite civilian and military forces. This link that translated into the Blue Book where he develops the foundations, the philosophical foundation of the Bolivarian Revolution. So this straw hat and the kepi are uh, the representations of this civil and military unity. So he created an ingenious uh, system of trenches that will offer a brave uh, response to uh, the conservative soldiers. Let's see next what the, this prestigious uh, historian from the Victoria town in his book, A Time of Ezequiel Zamora. Brito Figueroa considers that uh, Zamora was a paver of paths to conduct the peasant revolution to transform the structure of property and the ownership of the land. So we can see what uh, this great uh, Leon historian says, Leon Tapia. Next slide. In a book written by him, saying uh, over here went through Zamora, written also by uh, Brush a historian, very well-known well historian. When Zamora and Falcón reached Barinas, Falcón as uh, president of the campaign and Zamora, the head of the army, the difference 
aggravated among the two. This is important to understand the resentment against brilliant people, brilliant strategists, because they have their own light and mediocres try to despise and ignore those luminaries. The difference between the two deepened. Zamora took a single path. Falcón trying to find other roads. With Zamora, the whole world. With Falcón, the rich people belonging to the elite. Zamora giving the orders and Falcón with constant resentment against Zamora. To understand these phrases, we need to understand that Falcón was a mediocre. It's like Jago in Macbeth of William Shakespeare. So Jago is a good image to understand the ill, the evil of Falcón. In the next slide, we're going to understand why Chavez and Ramirez Rojas place Zamora as the linchpin of the revolution. Ezequiel Zamora is the root of the revolution because for him, the ownership property is a, is a still when it is not the result of work. And he says, it is not the same, the property of the Marquis of Pumar, that the properties of the peasants of El Totumal. For Zamora, land belongs to no one. It belongs to everybody, as uh, customs indicates, and says that before the arrival of the Spaniards, it was a common good, like the air, water, and sun. Therefore, we need to, to take the uh, goods and the properties of the rich because with that, they wage war to the people. Zamora is clear, but as well, it's not going to, to be the patrimony of any family or any person. His proposal is of the ca a country without uh, poor or rich, slaves and uh, masters, powerful and despised, but brothers and sisters that uh, without coitoing and surrendering, um, they will be equal. That is why he led a, a military movement to insert against the anti-Bolivarian elite that installed in Venezuela the Fourth Republic. Next, we go to the, the next slide, and we see the social importance of Ezequiel Zamora. After each battle, truthful to the Bolivarian dream of the great Colombia, always tells his soldiers, the homeland pays tribute to you for your effort, your activity, and your total devotion to the homeland that you have uh, expressed in the struggle to rescue the homeland against the dictatorship in order to attain prosperity and civilization that is prepared by the Colombian Federation, a natural consequence and precious result of our efforts and sacrifices. So we need to stress the importance of uh, remembering Zamora as part of the trees of the three roots. Bolivar as a military genius, Simon Rodriguez as a political genius. Both at the highest of levels, a military one and the, the political one. However, since independence 
the final independence is not achieved. And uh, as Clever Ramirez says, that people is independent when they can produce food, medicine, and dignity. And the economic blockade imposed on Venezuela is because we have the raw materials, but uh, Venezuela um, determined that we had to be dependent upon their uh, technology. They extracted the oil from Venezuela and uh, we need to buy it back in the form of uh, transform material. So we abandoned the fields and we had to uh, purchase food from abroad. So we didn't have a, a free nation. Therefore, Zamora is of the essence because if Bolivar, Sucre and Miranda had succeeded, Zamora had no reason to be. Zamora is just a continuation a need to go back to the Colombian Republic. In 1999, when the Bolivarian Revolution started in a peaceful manner through democratic elections, one of the, the great dreams of Hugo Chavez is to give continuity to the Colombian Republic that, of course, cannot be called as such because Nueva Granada took up the name of uh, Republic of Colombia. But Chavez still call it the, the uh, community of Latin American states, CELAC meaning that uh, the America without the United States and Canada, since they represent the border state, which is totally foreign to the Bolivarian proposal and its political uh, doctrine. Let's move forward to the next slide. Now we will see what was uh, the link between Samora and Bolivar? And we are always talking also about uh, Simon Rodriguez because they are the three bases of our Bolivarian revolution. Ezequiel Samora proposed to, to create communal spaces, uh, toparchies of Rodriguez. For Rodriguez, toparchies were very important as a space of territorial power. He says in 1847, Simon Rodriguez said, I hope that the parishes will be named as uh, toparchies because parishes had at the center a church, not a temple for faith, but a temple for power. So for Simon Rodriguez, toparchies needed to be created universities to be centers of uh, knowledge where food would be produced, would be protected, where there will be schools and self-sustained efforts, where there will be popular education and that relationship uh, among human beings with respect as equals. So for Samora, those topics were to be used to the benefit of the whole population with the idea of promoting a um, mind, a spirit, and a praxis that would be oriented towards a, a common a good, for instance, to assign land to the use of the farmers and to the use of all the villages. Some of the measures that Samora made could look like loving acts and caring acts for the children, the dispossessed children. And uh, he used to say that uh, the owners should uh, provide land to the people, to the peasants, to the farmers, so that they could provide free food to the dispossessed, 
So this is what a true politician needs to do to take care of uh, the people's interests and not of the oligarchy interests. And that will be guided by the Bolivarian doctrine and not by the Monroe doctrine. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Here, we are seeing the, the previous one, please, the previous one. Can we see the previous slide, please? Yes, so the victory of Santa Ines was the grave of the oligarchy. The immediate passage was to control of Caracas that was to take place in February 1860. So here you can see how the oligarchy understands what they need to do. After the Santa Ines triumph on December the 10th, 1850, the troops of Ezequiel Zamora were to reach Caracas in order to seize the full power of the union. And after that, unity was sold with the Nueva Granada, with the Ecuador, was more feasible, even though were to fight, but uh, Cesar Rengipo in that slide, the next slide, please. Here you can see Cesar Rengipo, one of the most important activists of the second decade, the second part of the 20th century in Venezuela. And uh, his play named uh, someone called Samora says this so follow it. What would be a that they enter triumph in this uh, city? Poor correct the hordes of a Tila, the maidens and the matrons of aristocracy will fall prey of the new homes. These words were spoken by Don Elicio Amérez, who was a young brigadier coming from the most distinguished families of the country in the play, someone called Ezequiel Zamora by César Regifo who understood very well the national spirit. And in ninth, he represented the year 1859, the year of the Santa Ines battle. So here you can see, please, next slide. Next slide. Here, you can see Ezequiel Zamora in the left part, and right, you can see the historian Juan Vicente González. On the 10th, Ezequiel Zamora was killed Crisó. by infiltrated enemies. Juan Cristóstomo Falcón and Antonio Guzmán Blanco gave the order to kill El Zamora. The historian Juan Vicente González had, had uh, hypocritically written the poem, My Obsequies to Bolivar in 1842. And when he knew about the crime, he said, lucky bullet, God bless 1,000 times the hand that shot that bullet. So as you can see here, we have an anti-Bolivarian uh, stance, an anti-Colombian stance, inhumane stance of this important Venezuelan historian. Next slide, please. We're very happy here in Venezuela because of the participation of so many people around the world, particularly in China. 
And uh, I think that this is very important. It's very important to tell what is happening in Venezuela and to tell the Una importancia para el... well, history. This is a history that is very relevant to the present. Simon Rod Los vanos como Falcón tells us about two kinds of men. The vain men, such as Falcón, Guzmán Blanco, Paez, and the historian González. And he says that these men are fatuous on occasion and most of the times arrogance. And the modest ones, such as the one that defeated oligarchy in the Santa Inés battle on the December 10, 1859, because only the man is respectful because he has a clear basis for his pretensions. He pretends with pride because he knows that he's going to do well. And this is the man that reunites the most number, the highest number of virtues. So there are two types of men for Rodriguez, the fatuous and the modest, the good and the bad. And this is why Victor Valera Mora, one of our great greatest poets says, Samora is written and a fire. And what we are, and we are what it happens, the possibility of the future. Let's see the next slide, please. And here you can see the hat. This is a very popular hat that were worn by women and men in the inner cities of Venezuela, in the provinces. The legacy of Samora, as we already said, the third root of the Bolivarian Revolution, teaches us that it is indeed possible to defeat oligarchy to give place to a communal society. It also teaches us that there are two types of enemy, enemies, the op opposition right and the right which is infiltrated in our ranks. For the time being, Let's listen to the voices of the Bolivarian network of choirs, Hugo Chavez, the lyrics of that song. The cloudy sky announces a thunderstorm and uh, the sun behind the clouds loses, loses its clarity. Oligarchs, be afraid, long live freedom. Next slide, please. People won the Battle of Santa Inés, but it did not won the war. Zamora was 43 years old when he was killed. Bolivar was 47 when he died in Santa Marta. Sucre, 35, when he was killed in Berruecos. They were all young they were all martyrs of the homeland. They were all reborn on December 6, 1998, when Chavez won the elections. And today they are million. Next slide. And this will be the last slide of the presentation. They were all relieved on December the 6th, 2020, when the people gained back the National Assembly. They and Nicolás Maduro Morris, our constitutional president of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, have a plan, a strategy, because as Simon Rodriguez explained, in his defense of Bolivar written in 1830, the tactics of a commander in chief is to avoid dangers and to secure victory. 
We already defeated Donald Trump. We are winning this hybrid war at a very high cost. A hybrid war that has separated families, that has transformed into a uh, media warfare against Venezuela, who have, which has humili humiliated the leadership figures in Venezuela, a warfare which is anti-Bolivarian war, a border war, a legal war, paramilitary war, a psychological war, a war that is perverse from all the possible perspectives, energy, epistemically speaking. It is a war that has affected the Venezuelan people particularly. We are winning this war, this hybrid war, at a very high cost. But to today, Hernan and us and all the public or the listeners who are following this uh, presentation can day to day that Ezequiel Zamora is alive, long live the homeland. Thank you very much, Hernan. Thank you to all of you. Today we have talked about Ezequiel Zamora land, free land and free men. Thank you very much for your attention. And this is the flag of the Republic of Colombia, the one dreamt by the liberator. And after Simon Bolivar, the liberator died, this flag was uh, uh, destroyed. From 1830, small republics were born so that the United States could activate it's a uh, Monroe doctrine in a fullest manner. And uh, he started, extracted the foundation of this uh, small republics so that uh, it could enlarge his domination over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali, for this very complete uh, um, summary on the legacy and the relevance of uh, Ezequiel Zamora. We, in the comments, we have greetings from different places from Venezuela, Ecuador, Argentina, Chile. And of course, there are some viewers followers from Canada, from the United States, from India, and South Africa. Very well then, now we will go to the first Q&A round from participants so that Professor Lee can answer uh, the questions and then we will listen to the second presentation of today. I will give now the floor to Jade Sutse to see what questions do we have from the Chinese streaming. There were more than 1,500 um, viewers following us. So Jade, yeah. you have the floor so that you can read the questions. Um, uh, we have uh, three questions. Uh, the first one, uh, you talk about the uh, the role of women in the uh, um, the revolution initiated by Samora. Could you uh, tell us uh, a little bit? Tell us a little bit more about the woman role in the revolution. Uh, the uh, second question is about the. Um, could you tell us the details of the land reform uh, by the Samora? And the uh, third question, uh, could you compare the land reform between Samora and Chavez? Yeah, three questions. Thank you. Perfecto, gracias, Jade, por esas preguntas. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Jade, for those questions. Thank you very much. Yes, allow me first to check 
the comment box just, just to check if there are other questions from the speaking Spanish speaking countries. No. No, just greetings from different places from Caracas, Valencia. But we do not have uh, further questions. So please, you have the floor. Thank you very much for that feminist question. Hugo Chavez always said that the Bolivarian Revolution was a feminist uh, revolution. And he, Venezuela, in fact, is a feminine gender country. We talk about the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, a female republic. But historically speaking, the role of women was made invisible. When we talk about one of the most important insurrections in Venezuela at the end of the 18th century, which occurred in La Guaira, we talk about the conspiration of Gual y España. In that conspiracy of Gual y España, uh, also participated Joaquina Sanchez, a woman, and she played a main role. She was considered the, the first uh, one to raise the patriotic uh, banner. But we also had women like Juana Ramirez. She was born in the Monagas estate and she devoted her life to the independence struggle. Paula Correa, also the mother of Ezequiel Zamora, she was a school teacher and uh, in Caracas, there is a part of Caracas called Ezequiel Zamora and the library which is there is called Ezequiel Zamora. So there are many women who participated and who played an important role. Today in the Bolivarian revolution, the organization of the local committees for food provision, what we know as the CLAP, the CLAP boxes, the CLAP boxes that uh, which purpose is to help the dispossessed sectors to face the economic warfare imposed by the United States. The organization of those uh, clap boxes is secured by women. So the role of women today is uh, very important. And uh, in terms of the uh, land reform, which was implemented by Ezequiel Zamora, was about uh, giving back the land to the original people. In other words, uh, the land belongs to those who work the land because there were many latifundiums, idle land, that uh, the owners did not take care of those lands. And the farmers, the peasants were enslaved by them. And uh, produce these land in very bad conditions. So Ezequiel Zamora wanted to give back the land to the originary peoples, to the peoples, to the farmers, which was the same reform applied by Simon Bolivar, by Sucre and Simon Rodriguez when the, the Republic of Bolivia was created in 1835 to give back the land to the indigenous populations, to provide education, universal education. And when there was to be a dispute between an indigenous and uh, a uh, land owner, the law needed to favor the dispossessed. Those laws of the people's power, popular power, were implemented by Bolivar, Sucre, and Simon Rodriguez in Bolivia. And those laws were 
also implemented by later by Ezequiel Zamora. But when he, when he did so, Falcón did not like the idea of giving back the land to the, to the indigenous uh, population because uh, the people participated mainly in the army. Hugo Chavez, what he did was to give continuity to that land reform that was started by Ezequiel Zamora, which was the same reform that was implemented by Simon Bolivar before him. So it is about giving the land to those who work and produce the land. The important thing is to, to ensure production is just not taking away the land from the rich. If the rich want to produce the land, so be it. It's okay, there is not a problem there. But what uh, it was not allowed was to enable um, idle land to exist. There cannot be idle lands if there is hunger. There is no ethic in that um, behavior. So we have already studied the role of women in the independence war. And actually this year on the 24th of June, we are going to celebrate the 200 years of the Carabobo battle. Women participated in that battle as warriors. And additionally, many of them woven the clothes that uh, the soldiers used in the Carabobo uh, fight, the Carabobo battle. So the women's participation in the revolution was very important indeed. Hello, Hona. Um, um, maybe um, I continue. We still have some uh, questions. Chad. Yeah. Huh? Yes. Um, the uh, piece give details on how the Great Columbia Republic could not be realized and broke up into smaller republics. And the second one, is there a necessary connection between land reform for local communities and a federalist greater Colombia? Fíjense ustedes. Eh... Yo he, yo he hablado aquí de la República de Colombia. I've no talked about the Republic of Colombia. I didn't want to talk about the great Colombia nation because Bolívar always talked about the Republic of Colombia. The great Colombia denomination is used by the traditional historiography because in 1863, the new Grenade took the name of Colombia. And to differentiate it from the new Colombia, histor historians called the uh, named the Great Colombia to differentiate that Great Colombia from the new Colombia. But uh, Bolivar always talked about the new Colombia because this is a dream actually of uh, Francisco de Miranda who considered that all Hispanic America was a great uh, republic called Colombia, which is not uh, the same thing as Colombia, which was the book collection that he had. Now, why the Republic of Colombia was disintegrated? Well, the Republic of Colombia had a very big army and they wanted to secure the independence of Puerto Rico and Cuba. And the Republic of Colombia in 1828, the embassy of the United States in our capital, which was in Bogota, tried to plot 
several uh, to assassinate uh, Simon Bolivar. And in September, they also tried to assassinate Simon Bolivar in what was called the night of December. But on the other hand, bankers in 1828 hide, hit the money, hit the paper money. You could not find paper money in the country. And traders started to hoarding food and uh, speculation was very high at the time. They created that high speculation. And on top of that, the press, the newspapers of that time in Argentina, in Chile, and in the United States, and in some countries in Europe, they created a media warfare against Simon Bolivar, an atrocious war. They called him a donkey. They called him a tyrant, a pirate. What the, the same thing what happens that happens with Nicolas Maduro today. <laughs> And the Republic of Colombia, just because it had Panama, could establish a maritime link between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. So our big country back then was a trans-ocean country. It was a country that was biggest than the United States at the time. And it was a country that was uh, growing constantly. Bolivia was with the Sucre. Bolivia was there, Peru was there, and the United States unleashed a, a political warfare with a smearing campaign from Lima to try to dismember the south of uh, Colombia, which was uh, placed in Guayaquil. So the United States were seeing how the Bolivarian doctrine was triumphant that was going to be enlarged to Mexico, from California to Argentina. And uh, if Bolivar, uh, Bolivar had not died and the, the Americas had not been dismantled, Colombia would be greater and bigger than uh, Russia. So this was going to be a gathering of Toperkis, as it was said. The Confederation of Toperkis was the best government that uh, a political system can have. From California, Texas, to Argentina, to the Patagonia, that was going to be a Confederation of Toperkis. So what represents today the Salak? Today, that would be one single republic, a great power, but not a, a power to exploit human beings. No, it was going to be a true emancipation, altruistic, humanistic emancipation, where the people, peoples would have the possibility of freeing themselves and enjoying of self-determination of the peoples and not killing indigenous population, which was what the United States did in the indigenous towns in the United States where they uh, plundered their cities, burned their ports, killed the people because they wanted to impose the white species with the ideas of the white supremacy because of the color skin of your skin. And they believe that even today that they are the masters of humanity. So the uh, Colombian Republic of the great Colombia, and I explained why I do not call it like this. That is why 
a the war is uh, launched against Bolivar, against the Bolivarian mo model that in Angostura in February, in the Angostura address, he explains who we are. We are, he says we are Indians, Africans, and Spaniards. And we have, have a high percentage of African blood since Muslims, Arabs, they dominated the Iberian Peninsula for 800 years through the Al Andalus. So even through this Spanish blood, we also have uh, African blood. That's our essence. When Europe and the US, they realize that we are a mixed blood that breaks with the theories of racism that uh, after 1819 start to accelerate, saying that the Caucasian race is the superior race and many other stupid concepts. And uh, if there is a single race, there are no races. Thank you very much for your question. I hope I have answered your uh, uh, questions and satisfied your curiosity. Thank you, Ali, for your answers. We have other questions in the next round. I'm going to read them to you. What was the source of the concept of assembly at the time of Bolivar? as a body of government. There are comments and uh, greetings from South Africa, and they, they want to continue building narratives against the hegemonies. They ask, what is the possibility for the Bolivarian Revolution to Re go back that uh, the causes of the people may be betrayed. What is the possibility that today we betray the aspirations of the people? How to prevent our pseudo leaders, the pseudo leaders of our country, to reach power and then uh, surrender our uh, wealth as uh, announced by Galeano in his book, The Open Veins of Latin America. Based on the genius of Bolivar and Rodriguez, can we affirm that Zamora synthesized the idea of a civilian and uh, military unity? There is another question. Can you give us your take on the achievement of the Zamora mission since its creation in 2004? Those are the questions. So you have the floor, Ali. It is clear that Zamora is an example of the struggle based on the Bolivarian ideas premised on the integration of the Latin American area, the communes, and so on. But not only Zamora. Castro, later on, with Uribe, Eloy Alfaro, and other leaders of the region of that time, Celaya in Nicaragua at that time, they want to go back to the 
Republic of Colombia. That's a dream that was truncated, but there's still hopes that uh, this could be rescued. The second question was the origin of the notion of the assembly as a political body. Well, on March the 2nd, next week, we will commemorate another year of uh, the March the 2nd, 1811, of the first Constituent Assembly of Venezuela, of Latin America and the second Constituent Assembly of the Americas. So this is the origin of the July the 5th, 1811, when the Independence Act is signed. That year, the first constitution is drafted, but this assembly has a major weight. You're asking about the concept of assembly for Bolivar. Well, that assembly, in that assembly, some people were still struggling to, re to return to Ferdinand VII um, Venezuela, because remember that uh, Ferdinand was in Bayon, in jail, because uh, Napoleon was in Spain, and it is the Spanish people who defended the Spanish sovereignty, as we see in many paintings, like the Goya. So there in that assembly, many deputies defend Ferdinand VII. Others want the signature of the signing of the act of the act. Because they the, the United States was an example of liberty because it had uh, delivered itself of the chains of the UK. So they wanted the document to be signed on July the 4th. So Bolivar in the Congress of Angostura, he said, how glorious is the citizen that has been able to convene this assembly under the arms of the Republic. So in that address of Angostura, Bolivar is very clear. Our code is not the code of Washington, he said very clearly. Regarding the Zamora mission, we are not going to discuss only the mission as such. All missions played a major role. We need to be clear about this. Chavez created the missions based on the theory of the needs, not of Abraham Maslow. In the pyramid of the, of the needs, he says, there are several basic food, Uh, protection to those without uh, clothing, medicine to the sick, and happiness to the sad. Based on these basic needs, Chavez created the great social missions. So we have uh, the housing mission, the Samora mission, the PR, Arbol, and so on. And then this 
lead to the plan of the homeland and to save the human race because the capitalist model is a predator model that uh, goes against the survival of humanity. So we understand the weight this mission has. So when you follow the thread of history, you realize that the struggle of Jose Maria España Angual and Joaquin Sanchez is the same struggle that uh, before Jose Leonardo Chirinos had waged in Coro. And it's the same uh, struggle of Negro Miguel. And uh, even behind, we had all the struggle of the original peoples. And ahead of us is the same struggle for independence of Francisco de Miranda, Sucre, Bolivar, and the same struggle waged by Zamora, and the same struggle waged by my Santa, the same struggle of Argemiro, Gabaldon, Fabricio, Ojeda, Gouverneur. Women are always present, uh, Olga Luzardo in Zulia, and the same struggle waged later on by Hugo Chavez on February the 4th, 1992. And it's the same struggle of Nicolas Maduro Moro today. That something could happen as happened to Zamora, well, it's hard that betrayal could happen because the Bolivarian revolution today has President Nicolas Maduro as the political arm of the revolution, but also has Diosdado Cabello, Vladimir Padrino Lopez, a Bolivarian armed force where they are the intelligence and counterintelligence uh, weapons required in order to find uh, those who might betray this revolution. Then we have a Bolivarian militia. We have uh, a people with the military intellectual capabilities required to defend this revolution, to defend it from this enemy and others, other enemies that might come later on. So there is political awareness of the role of the Bolivarian Revolution in the geopolitical context. Venezuela is today the geopolitical epicenter of the world. We are mindful that uh, they give uh, the insatiable thirst of wealth of the United States and the European Union with the NATO as the armed uh, um, arm, the terrorist organization of the North of the Northern Atlantic. They, they want our coastline. They want our the wealth. The coastline is required because through that coastline, they can then export better the drug coming from Colombia in order to drug the US youth so they cannot see what is going on, and so they can never rebel against uh, their government and against the violence deployed by the US around the world with the, the atomic bomb in bombs in Nagasaki, in Japan, and so on. Thank you, Ali. There is a request, an additional request from China, because land is a very uh, crucial topic in China. As we have discussed in previous sessions, land reform is one of the main legacy of uh, the Cultural Revolution in China. Therefore, they ask you to briefly cover the land reform 
en Venezuela. And let me see if we have other questions. There are greetings from South Africa and many other regions. So again, we give you the floor to cover the topic of land reform. So we, let's uh, address this topic of uh, land reform. Say we took Nyapa. Nyapa is to answer another question. If I, for instance, I purchase uh, bananas, once I pay, uh, I ask for a Nyapa, meaning uh, give me a little bit more for what I already paid. Well, the land reform put forward by the Bolivarian Revolution is based on the great struggles. First, the, the love people have for the land. Venezuela was a country whose economy was confiscated from immemorial times for people in China, in Argentina, and other countries to truly grasp this idea. The, ex the very existence of Venezuela started from the 13,000 before Christ. Why do I say this? Because close to Coro, there is an archeological park, Taima Taima. In the 60s, archeologist Crusen from Catalonia, together with a team, they found the rest of giant animals. And this was a mastodont. And the, in the pelvis, they found an arrow when the carbon 14 analysis was conducted on this animal, they were surprised with the results of the test. It was 13,000 years before Christ. If we analyze our history, 13,000 years before Christ, and we are talking about our America, no longer about Venezuela. We are talking about the Maya civilization the Aztec and Inca civilizations, the cultivation of tomato, uh, potatoes, maize, the large pyramids, the favorable weather in the climate in the Caribbean with eternal summer, without four seasons. So those people lived like that until the October 1492, because the next day the Spanish invasion arrived to reset our culture. Those 14,000 years were erased. They reset our hard disk. Our history then seems to begin on October the 12th, 1492. It means 96.5% of our existence. Since Colón, we only have 3.5% of our existence. In the rest of the period, we have a love for our land. We cherish our land. We like to be in communes. We uh, plant and the fruit belongs to all. When the animal we chase, the animal is shared. When we fish, the fish belongs to all of us. And when a friend 
when the family wants to have children, the commune, the community builds a house. So for all those 14,000 years, we lived in that fashion. But in 1492, they told us that that land did not belong to us anymore that the fish was no longer ours, that the cattle was no longer ours. And on top of that, they exploited us, they imposed another religion, other cultures. There was a countercultural attack to transform us in vassals. So for the liberators, revolutionaries, it is vital, the, the land. In 1847, Simon Rodriguez said, talking about the love for the land, the value of creation is to make sure that people cherish the production of the land in this fashion, we destroy the provincial privileges. Hopefully, each parish should love the land. In that case, we can build a confederation, the perfect, most perfect government that could be imagined by politics. It is the way to get rid of despotism. And it says, he says that this is possible only if we teach, teach so people know and to train so people know what to do. So the attachment to the land is of the essence. When he, when Chavez says commune or nothing, is not just a slogan, it's not a, a fashion. It is a philosophy stemming from our 96% of the 96% of our history, the attachment, the devotion to the land. The land belongs to those who labor and toil the land. So friends from China, we are not saying that we need to confiscate the land to the rich. If the rich have land and they work that land without exploitation of the people, they are welcome to the revolution because we need their contribution. Now, we do not need our parasites who live out of the, the fruit of the state. We need rich who produce, rich people who can produce, who are fully aligned like the four stars in the flag of China and the stars of the Communist Party at the heart, meaning the workers, peasants, professionals, and the owners of the production means. So, we need to be attached to what Zamora says. That is why we continuously hear about comuneros and transfer of power to comuneros because that con contradiction between the constituent power and constituent power. But it is vital for us to conduct the land reform because the purpose is simply that we do not have idle lands in fallow. We need producing lands. There is hunger. And this is unacceptable when we have very rich lands. Thank you very much, Professor, for your presentation and thank you for the answers. Following this presentation, we are going to have, and I will invite Professor Ali to continue joining us to 
for the next presentation. So at the end, we can have a global Q&A period. We have Pablo Jimenez, economist, professor of the Bolivarian University, coordinator of the program of political economy of the Bolivarian uh, University, activist and militant of the Bolivarian Revolution for a long time. And we thank him for coming and uh, to compliment the analysis conducted by Ali and talking about uh, the validity of the legacy of uh, Zamora for the revolution. So we are going to give the floor to Pablo, who is going to share my the computer with me. Good morning from Venezuela, sharing phones and computers and connection. After listening to Professor Ali with the very vast exposition on the validity of uh, the thoughts of Zamora, I'm going to I'm going to refer more to the context, to economic aspects that uh, could complement the important presentation made by Professor Ali Ramon Rojas. In that regard, I think uh, I'm going to connect. I am going. I am going to start with the final part of his presentation: the question on the land reform. In the case of Venezuela and in Latin America, and also the colonies in South America, we can see that uh, the distribution of the land occurred as a result of the conquest crusade, the con conquest process. The kings of uh, Spain allotted the land based on violence and domination. And this is how they uh, distributed the land. However, in different periods of the time, there, were legis there was legislation which attempted to protect the communal lands due to the fact that the indigenous population was uh, devastated and there were there was legislation aimed at protecting the indigenous population however in the case of venezuela according to certain historians this process didn't occur in that manner and on the contrary on the 16th and in the 18th uh, centuries there was a high concentration of the former communal lands. The Spaniard Empire conquested a continent, imposed the exploitation manners and perpetuated three centuries based on the land territorial and the concentration of the land in a small group of families. That model is named by Mario Sanoja Obediente, a Venezuelan important writer, was called the colonial society, governed by the elites, which was based on the accumulation process, based on the land property over the 16th and 18th century. And later in the 19th century, it is this small elite who is going to rebel against the Spanish empire and claim it for the right to, to trade and the possibility to reach independence from the Spanish empire. Sanoja used to say, that uh, 
that elite was asking for different ways to interact with Spain to stop the power and the control and in order to avoid the destruction of the property, the production, and uh, the imposition of taxes that were unbearable. So that process of concentrating the land. Esta sociedad mantuana colonial tiene un primer corte en. Practiced by that uh, elite society. It started changing in November, in April the 19th. Uh, 1810 with the Declaration of Independence. Then there was the war for independence and then with the demise of the liberator. At the beginning, the project was a Udinist project to gain independence. But uh, these small groups of power came back to, to to their domination. After the Bolivar's death, they came back. And prior to the independence of 1810, they were not uh, totally active. At the beginning, they were taking the lead at the declaration of independence. But during the war, they, uh, uh, with the exception of uh, Simon Bolivar, they were left at the margin of the struggles. In 1813, that uh, period of uh, the domination of the, the, the powerful was reinstated. And from the important part of the 19th century and the 20th century, there was the instauration of the oligarchic Venezuela. Some call them the agrarian Venezuela, but uh, the beginning of that model that uh, left important consequences in the economy and that took place over the 19th century and also in the 20th century, it is still present. And at the end of the 20th century, it is still pretty much present. It is only with the Bolivarian Revolution that we took up the discussion of uh, all these uh, topics that were left aside. So from the exploitation of the great uh, latifundios or the great uh, owners of the land came a new provincial oligarchy, oligarchy that was protected by the military. And what did, what did happen? What happened there? The former proper uh, owners of the land who founded the first families that had a great accumulation of the land which were given to them by the monarchy, they started losing their key role. And these families who were deprived from the power, they um, then made an alliance with the military who betrayed the unionist project, believers project that led to the division of the great Colombia. And uh, this is how they came together and they formed a new oligarchy, a new provincial oligarchy with the participation of the landowners who is going to be divided in a military faction. And, and there were also this uh, rich uh, people from that time that were left and uh, they're going to uh, assemble with the commercial bourgeoisie. And through marriages and partnerships, they created a new caste in, in power. So as um, Orlando Araujo said, a writer in one of his books named uh, The Violent Constitution, he says that uh, the man who drafted Constitution of 1830 
created the Republic of Venezuela, separated from the project of the Great Colombia, those who drafted the constitution were the same land owners who had convened the people to conquest the political power. They were the direct descendants of those conquerors that from the who from the 16th century were using and seizing the land constantly. So the 19th century, according to the writer, was a century characterized by the accumulation of land. And uh, the land landowners who just made themselves richer by accumulating land constantly. However, the process of the independence fights, there are in interesting facts. There is a decree of a, the liberator in 1817, according to which the legal provisions that were created after the independence or after the division of Venezuela from the great Colombia so the is to eliminate the decree of a, the, the Bolivar decree on the confiscation of property that to belong to the royalists that had emigrated. It was approved by Simon Bolivar in 1817. This is the ancient legal disposition regarding the ownership of the land. So it is like a, a precedent of the agrarian uh, law. And it is the way in which uh, the liberator addressed the dominating uh, groups. Today, in the Bolivarian Constitution, which was approved in 1999, enshrines, for instance, the social interests. The property is uh, subjected to social interest. There are no illimited properties, and this is an important uh, fact. And one precedent of that uh, principle is contained in the decree of uh, 1817 by the, the liberator which wanted to distribute uh, the land and the property and uh, the legislation and the provisions which were approved after 1830 also establish that the right to property is incompatible with any way of confiscation the land needs to be used for the social interest and in the development of the country. So these new, or that project that was consolidated from 1830 was named as a Republic of Landowners. Historians, historians call it the oligarchy Republic. That oligarchy Republic was uh, made up by yeah. El grupo coming from different groups. As I said, the group of the Montuanos, or the rich part of the society who associated with the uh, traders, traders who were mainly uh, from Germany, from uh, the United Kingdom, who got married uh, with the uh, members of the rich class of Venezuela, there is a military caste who also betrayed the unionist uh, project for the independence uh, of uh, the Americas proposed by Miranda and Simon Bolivar. And on the other hand, there was a, well, among the group of the military and the group of the Entonces, lo que se conoce como... and uh, commercial oligarchy, uh, we uh, derived to the oligarchy of society. That it is a way to perpetuate uh, the 
then the control over the land based on a provincial property of the land or provincial latifundium. Which are the most important characteristics of this model? They have uh, the capability of controlling slaves, mm, blacks, indigenous population, mestizos, and uh, they developed a production model based on feudal feudalism and on slavery. And this uh, workforce was at the same time constrained to participate in the army and the uh, guardians, so to speak, of uh, this uh, landowners, which will lead to internal wars because they want La the power, the trade bourgeoisie, commercial, Venezuelan bourgeoisie, which was uh, seeking to secure control over the land and uh, the population. And uh, they later created The another bourgeoisie based on the speculation, they entered into the world trade and uh, they were able to place the products that came from the production of the land. They were practicing intensive uh, agriculture and they were accumulating the use of the land. So. There were also many idle lands and uh, a lot of exploitation of the labor work, labor force in the very abusive conditions. They did not guarantee any kind of decent conditions to the farmers or those who work the land. So in the oligarchy republic, what we see is a government which uh, practiced free trade with foreign countries, but uh, domestically they practiced uh, relationships based on feudalism and on slavery. That domination based on the ownership of the land which uh, enabled them to place uh, some products in Europe, such as coffee, cocoa, and uh, also in the plains, um, cattle. But uh, we have to say that due to the independence war wars, there was uh, a worsening of uh, the cattle uh, production, cattle of livestock production. So they had the possibility of placing their products in the international market, and uh, they had a surplus. And uh, this uh, made them or gave them the possibility to concede grants. And in 1884, they approved the law of uh, contract or freedom of contracts. This law of freedom of contracts of uh, 1834 was uh, enforced until 48. And according to the law, it was possible to conclude contracts to claim the payment of all uh, debts and uh, the assets of uh, the owners can be sold if the owners don't pay for the, the grants. And uh, the will of the parties will be respected. And generally speaking, this law 
gives uh, the freedom to this uh, bourgeoisie, which is in close partnership with the trade bourgeoisie and with the rich classes, it it's enables, enables them to grant loans and to put delays and conditions. And if those delays and conditions are not fulfilled, then they could uh, sell the property of those who have the debts and they could sell them at any price, a price and within any delay they wanted or they deemed necessary. This was the model of the law of contracts. It worked for a while, but it also served to this class, to this bourgeoisie, a small sector of the rich, the Caracas bourgeoisie, to continue um, accumulating the land and accumulating riches. So the bourgeoisie, the oligarchy of uh, the landowners, and also uh, in, a, in alliance with a, a group of military, they are going to challenge the power of the Caracas oligarchy. So there is a debate between the conservatory party and the liberal party. There were the two models that were at odds, but uh, we look the political programs they had and the proposals they had, none of the two sectors were offering any true agrarian reform. And the conservatory party did not offer anything and the liberal party according to Domingo Alberto Rangel he says that the liberal party should have raised the possibility of uh, modernizing Venezuela to address the capitalist development in order to produce a agrarian reform but the liberal party was made up of uh, segments of the provincial military bourgeoisie and also by a sector of uh, intellectuals such as Leocaldio Guzman, who owned a journal, a journal that um, published the, the beliefs of the party. And Ezequiel Zamora was actually a follower of this, uh, this journal and the uh, this journalist. And uh, since we're talking about Zamora, Zamora, he became one of the leaders of uh, the Liberal Party. So this oligarchy based on the land property was an obstacle to the development of the forces of Venezuela. And um, The country was paralyzed, and uh, that model was functioning only to benefit the oligarchy sector, which, in other way, also and um, I have shared some graphs to date. I would like uh, Jade to show one of the graphs on the foreign trade of Venezuela in the 1830 till the 1900s. There you can see this graph explaining the foreign uh, trade. And here we see the percentages. The percentages of the foreign trade activity, exports and uh, imports. In gray, we see imports and orange. In gray, we see exports, and in gray, we see imports. And uh, the source is Asdrubal Batista. Well, we can see that uh, the way in which the power was exercised based on the accumulation model in the latifundian Venezuela which did not really address the agrarian reform, 
because that reform was at the service of the oligarchy and at, at the service of the landowners. Based also on the freedom of trade, they, using the income of the state, income coming from the ports, they were paying more for the, the import duties than what they paid for the export duties. Professor Sanoja Obediente, in his book of social history, social cultural history of Venezuela, provided interesting data. He says that in 1842, or between 1842 and 1843, and 1875 and 1878, he's comparing the two periods, the tax income for export duties raised 83% in the first period and 91% in the second period. And the public expenditure went from 140% to one and 185%. In the first, they rose 140 in the second period, 185. So in spite of the fact, or even though the model worked for them because they had income from the foreign trade, the expenditure superseded in an important manner the income. And this shows that the functioning of the state was uh, falling in a deficit. And this is the reason why they had to ask for loans. So this is another characteristic of the oligarchy republic the indebtedness model that they use, which uh, made Venezuela to suffer from chronic indebtedness. And many of the debts were inherited from the independence war. The main uh, provider of funds was, was the United Kingdom. And uh, from 1830 onwards, the debt was uh, distributed thanks to a negotiation process with other republics that belonged to the Great Colombia. But due to the way in which the liberalism took place or the free the, the, in 1834 and 1842, we had a stable period, but from 1842, due to the fall of uh, the prices of commodities of uh, agricultural products, there was instability in the world market, and this had an impact on the income of the nation, which uh, uh, led to more indebtedness and a difficult and deficit, uh, deficitary functioning of uh, the, the state. So this uh, um, explained the reason why some Lionine contracts were concluded. Guzman Blanco was uh, one of the first who negotiated these contracts. And then Paez, who also concluded some of these uh, contracts with negotiators. Just, uh, this is the way in which uh, we gave away totally our resources because of the uh, indebtedness of that time. The bourgeoisie, there's a trade uh, bourgeoisie during the federal war offered they went up to offering the Guyana region. In fact, the Guyana region was one of the states of the federal entities that uh, harbors important mineral resources 
that are still being exploited today. In Guyana, there are important water resources, and we're talking about a very vast uh, a piece of land, which is very meaningful to Venezuela. So by that time, in the time of the federal war, there's a war to see in order to get rid of Samora and uh, to get rid of that movement that started fighting or fighting back due to all the characteristics of uh, to all the social economic conditions that led to the federal war. And uh, since Samora felt a connection with, uh, and the people felt a connection with Samora because he felt a connection with the black, with the Indians. Samora was like the proper figure who would lead the transformation process. since the inability of the Liberal Party to act. So this bourgeoisie offered the kingdom of the United Kingdom, the region of Guyana, in exchange for their intervention so that they could defeat the troops of the Federation. So they went up to, they offered the very important piece of uh, the Venezuelan territory. I'm looking for the quotation, but I can't find it. And not only they did this, they also, the British creditors, they claimed the debt and they resorted to Leonine contracts. They offered 55% of the, of the income coming from the imports and exports, 55% at the beginning. And uh, little by little, they established an indebtedness process, which uh, weakened the possibilities of national development and that weakened the possibilities of transforming the Venezuelan economic structure. And it was not until the 20th century after 1936, I would say that for 19, 26 was the main expert. So, and it is in the 30s, 40s of the 20th century that we start the sign to see signs of modernization. So only through oil, forced modernization of the country occurred. And it's going to engender new problems, but the problem of independence, namely the need for wealth distribution, the need to conduct the land reforms, those problems are inherited up to the beginning of the Bolivarian Revolution. Here we see the share of the powers in Venezuelan imports. In the yellow line is the US, and the gray line is the UK. Great Britain was our main commercial partner during 19th century. But there is a, a scissors effect at the end of the 19th century. We see the rise of the US share in Venezuelan imports. This will, will increase dramatically with the uh, oil industry and the 
the agreement of uh, trade reciprocity in the 30s of the 20th century. So these are the root causes of the federal war. These are the root causes of the rebellion of Samora, and these are the causes that led to the uh, amalgamation of the social class around Zamora, and that led to the first rebellion of 1846, and then to 1859 and 60, up until his assassination. And there are two hypotheses. First, that it was a uh, bullet sent by the conservative band, but also a bullet from the same group following the liberal uh, grouping. But then in Cocha agreement, we understood that uh, they were not going to affect the interest of the bourgeoisie, even though they proposed a modernization drive. And in Caracas, we still have uh, the relics of that project in the terms of social economic structure, development of productive forces, economic model. They perpetuated the same situation that uh, led the Venezuelan people to join the libertarian army, to join Bolivar, and then also to join uh, the cause of the federal war. Today, we have the Bolivarian Revolution, and with the Land Act and land development agreed by Chavez that, again, we attempt to distribute lands and Commander Chavez proposed that uh, land should be given and that the, the property titles should be reviewed um, on the families that since the 17th century up until the beginning of the 21st century uh, used to have uh, all the land in the country, well, Chavez demanded the titles on that land from the first title issued by the King of Spain up until our days. And we discovered in many cases that there were the falsifications, uh, that they have enlarged their property and uh, without any legal basis for ownership, without economic foundation. So many of those lands were the, distributed, uh, confiscated, and distributed among the peasantry. Therefore, uh, Zamora is still valid today. The, uh, the, the federal war remained valid. The principles are there. They represent a rebellion cry in favor of equality, distribution of wealth, and land reform, because even though we have the Land Act, Today in Venezuela, we still have to uh, struggle to ensure democratization of land. Until, up until two years, there was a the peasant uh, march that reached the capital, making concrete demands. And we have a very active campesino movement uh, that keep on the struggle. And there are campesinos uh, groupings that are the, working in various mechanisms of uh, democratization of the production and the land, like the people to people. We have already discussed these groupings. So in that regard, uh, Zamora remain alive and kicking. His legacy is very much alive and uh, his mottos are still there and they accompany the Venezuelan uh, campesino movement. Thank you very much. I give the floor to Hernan again. Thank you, Pablo. 
for this intervention and your analysis that was a great compliment to what uh, Professor Ali said at the outset. Then with this intervention, we can then start an, a new Q&A period. I just want to make a few comments before reading some of the questions posed by the participants. First, in the case of Zamora, and what Alba TV did before this session, they used images of a, a movie produced recently named Zamora Land and Free Men, Free People. It was directed by a well-known director, Roman Chalbot, and you should watch it. Those who have the possibility to watch it, I encourage you to do so. Through the chat, we could uh, send uh, a summary of this movie. And the other thing is, people are have been asking where we they could find the sessions. The videos as such of each one of the sessions, they are available in the YouTube channels of uh, Red Alba TV. And then in the chat, you can have the link. And then at the end of the seminar this year, they will be available both in English and Mandarin in the portal of the University of Sustainability. Also, we are trying to work with all the sessions of the seminar in order to have a, a book of the whole seminar, the content of this seminar of the Venezuela struggles. Very well. The last comment before starting with the questions There is a text, a political text, very well known, which is again, the blue book. It is a guideline, guideline, a benchmark built in the 90s by Chavez. It has been recently relieved by Maduro, and wondering how to pursue the revolution. So uh, Nicolas Maduro republished this book to establish the continuity of the revolution. Nicolas Maduro, in this book, he says, Chavez takes to the present the Samorian spirit for us to understand the continuity of a struggle between the, the, the oligarchs and the dispossessed, the oligarchs who took up power. And this links with the message sent by the, our two speakers. They have been accumulating privileges and Samora is the social struggle that continues, that goes on for equality. So, in this uh, re-edition of this book, we find these words. In the original edition of the book, Chavez says, and I want to share this. I, at the beginning, I said, that uh, the cause of this book as a benchmark for the revolution comes from the crisis of uh, left-wing ideologies in the region of Latin America at the end of the 80s. 
So here we find this, the ideological debate of that time. And Chavez says, the model completing the theology of ideologies finishes with Zamora, that comes from the roots of the homeland. There is a philosophical synthesis that could guide us that sh shock the bourgeoisie at the time of Zamora, the oligarchy of Zamora that uh, assassinated the general when he launched the federal slogans. And three, these three slogans could synthesize the popular re rebellion of Zamora. First, land and free people. The second, popular elections. And third, horror to the oligarchy. So with those three phrases, I'd like to set the framework for the coming questions and answers. Because as Ali mentioned, and Pablo as well, we have this idea that Ezequiel Zamora not only proposes the fight for equality, but also to go back to the historical project, to resort to the communal project, which is the original project. And uh, Mario Sanoja, Aida Barca, they rescue this project. The Bolivar Revolution has been a, a march of the communal aspect. And we have already mentioned the communal aspect and the importance of the communal approach. Is the, the land for the communes, the, the renting of the land, the, fit, the setting of wages for labor, the idea of uh, using cows for the commons, for the consumption of the community. So, Ezequiel Zamora not only is talking about land and free people, but also the community of land. The idea was uh, going back to, to the commons and not to property, property coming from Europe. So in our case, we need to go to the commons. The communal aspect breaks with the idea of the individuality to go back to the co collective action. And that's part of the result of the revolt led by the Zamora. I'm going to share with you some of the links, the blue book. I've not found the English version. We could try to find the English version. And also the, the summary of the film on Zamora. Okay, so now we're going to read some of the comments and questions. When the Spanish Empire came to Venezuela, they were solely interested in the, the wealth, land, cocoa, Coffee. So we need to share some of these references. Some people. Let's see if we have other questions. Currently, we are trying to create, we are in a oligarchical republic. They think that we are still in an oligarchical republic. Edson says, can we talk 
about the role of public education in the revolutionary process in Venezuela. Well, it's not the main topic of this session. However, we could raise it and Pablo could make a comment on this. Paola, when the Spaniard started to exploit cocoa and coffee, Those crops were important for our economy at that time. Those are some of the questions. So I'm going to give the floor to Jave. So yeah. the questions coming from the Chinese streaming. Yeah, uh, we are interested in uh, land uh, reform. So uh, as far as we know, uh, President Maduro followed um, uh, President uh, Chavez's uh, land reform. So could you uh, evaluate or also tell us the uh, current situation about land reform in today uh, Venezuela? That's question one. And the other one is about, uh, could you com compare the uh, land reform between Samora and also uh, President Chavez? So, we have here a continuity of some of the recurrent questions of this seminar, especially in this stage namely the land reform. As uh, we said before, is a, a crucial topic. So what have been the progress made in land reform in Venezuela? And uh, how we can compare land reform at the time of Chavez, land reform today with Maduro, compare the two. Okay, hay una, hay una pregunta en desarrollo que tiene Paola Moncada, pero bueno, creo que la está escribiendo todavía, así que podemos esperar un poco que la termine de, de completar. Bueno, pero ya tenemos entonces una batería de preguntas sobre, con, en base a las cuales Le podemos dar we have a la... number of questions, so we can give the floor to Pablo. Sobre el tema educativo primero. Eh, bueno. Regarding the education topic, all Bolivarian uh, project or revolutionary project is an educational project. From the beginning of the Bolivarian Revolution, we have uh, stressed the need for education and pedagogy. One of the vanguard projects is the Bolivarian schools, then Bolivarian high schools, all the basic education level. Uh, Professor Ali mentioned the missions social missions with the high component of education, the Robinson mission for the literacy of 98% of the population, the rivers that incorporated uh, people excluded uh, from basic education, and the Sucre mission to incorporate more than 400,000 uh, people to higher education, excluded from the conventional system by universities. So all revolution is uh, at heart an educational revolution. And it is connected to the quest for social equality, wealth distribution, creation of opportunities, which are the demands of the Venezuelan people since 
the time when the emancipating project started. Are we today an oligarchical republic? The oligarchical republic In my view, it is just my opinion, the oligarchical republic, republic ended with the development of, of the oil industry. At the beginning of the Venezuelan capitalism, which is the oil capitalism. From then on, New problems arise. The way this capitalistic production aggravates the problems left behind by the oligarchical republic, the uh, land uh, ownership, a country without uh, communication infrastructure, the export in Venezuela, but uh, exporting only for agricultural goods, enabling a group of uh, families to enrich themselves and a sector of the, the commercial bourgeoisie to get richer. So that sector that was in power during the oligarchical republic is going to surround Juan Vicente Gómez, and there is an anecdote of a captain of a military house, the presidential guard, that in the 70s, they are cleaning the presidential palace and they found some documents. Those documents were to be rejected and destroyed, and a historian was called upon the head of the historian uh, center. It was J. Velázquez that ended up being president. So in the 70s, he was just a historian, and there he, he's consulted about these documents. Is as, as president of the Academy of History, asking him to come over to Miraflores to review some documents, because we are going to destroy these documents because we consider that they are not important. So when the J. Velázquez go to Miraflores, they found the concessions given, the documents of the concessions given by Gómez, or the negotiations that led to the concessions by these uh, landowner sectors of the economy, they gave uh, concessions, concessions over concessions. They were given the land to the oil industry. And there you have the amounts paid. That document, an English historian, we can find the name of this historian. He prepared a doctoral thesis. And then when you review the list of the families, you're going to find similarities with the, the families belonging to the landowner oligarchy formed in the colonial times In the, were a part of the, the oligarchical republic, and we're going to find the same names with the current uh, capitalistic uh, bourgeoisie in Venezuela. We are going to find the Capriles, we are going to find Mendozas, we are going to find very well known names, family names. So, are we still? Oligarchical republic today? No, not strictly speaking. Based on the socioeconomic uh, structure, we are not, because that uh, structure was the one that prevailed in the 19th century. And until 
the 30s of the 20th century when oil enables the modernization of the country. There is an incipient uh, process of dependent uh, development and industrialization. Today, we have uh, the so-called democratic period of alternation of between parties, which was was a process of inclusion. It was not an oligarchical uh, republic, but it's exclusive uh, republic dependent on the Venezuela, on, on the US government with the signing of the Punto Fijo Treaty. And now we have the fifth republic, the Bolivarian Republic, and it has nothing to do in principle with an oligarchical um, uh, republic. Now, as a result of the drop of the oil prices, as a result of the uh, uh, unilateral measures, the blockade, the price of oil, and the war prices between producing countries, it has led to the drop, the plummet of oil prices since 2015. Uh, there is a closing of facilities, a drop of income as a result also of the sanctions. And in 2017, the country cannot have uh, financial or trade relations with the world as a result of the commercial and financial blockades of President Trump. And in 20 2020, on top of that, oil prices reached zero. And we have also the COVID crisis that has halted the world economy. Well, the economic situation has been very complicated in the country this year. And uh, those uh, bases of the Bolivarian socialism. And so one of the pillars was the oil income and that oil rent does not exist today in Venezuela, then faced with the lack of that rent, there are groupings and uh, that existed in the past, but that today are more evident and are becoming stronger in the economic relations. But that does not mean that we are in an oligarchical republic today. When we started with the agro exporting Venezuela, well, this is the case where land are distributed among a number of uh, produce, such as the Llanos for the cattle raising, the Andes for coffee growing, the center western areas basically with sugar cane and other the produce and cacao, cocoa in the north part of the country, in the northern part of the country. So those are the reforms of uh, Richard III in the 18th century that uh, in the same manner as they connect us with the world economy and uh, trade, they lay the foundations for the process of independence. So in that case, it is under discussion. So this is what some of the historians tell us about the economic perspective. And it is the opinion also of the other historians, the continuity between Zamora, Chavez and Maduro and uh, also the question on the agrarian reform and how can we compare them in this regard. The second uh, answer, I talked about uh, how from the independence process and uh, the distribution of land in Venezuela, we can see the management of the land, which excluded um, the people. The India's laws tried to mitigate this process. 
But in the Venezuelan case, it was indeed a very violent process because uh, the communes were, the indigenous communes were deprived from the land. The land was concentrated in a few hands. And uh, ever since that moment, we have been claiming uh, for the necessity of an agrarian reform. And what continuity can we establish? Well, Samora was killed, he was betrayed, he was shot, but his legacy, his proposal, his reading was not something that he just thought about. It was something that started far back, that started as a result of the violent process of the accumulation of the regional lands, as a result of the colonization process that was present in the agrarian Venezuela and uh, that led to the independence process under the names of the pro-independent movements from by Leonardo Chirinos and others. So all those movements and uh, the interpretation that it was made at that time, all the pressure exerted on the people the purpose was the democratization of the land. But unfortunately, the governments of the 20th century, when they started the modernization process of Venezuela, they were not successful in establishing agrarian reform. There was a law that was approved during, for, during the Fourth Republic. Uh, Romulo Gallegos uh, made uh, proposals as well as uh, Romulo de Betancur. But any of those proposals really address a true agrarian reform. It was thanks to President Chavez from his ideological uh, program that was built at the heat of the struggles, which he, he called the three rooted tree. And then when he seized power, all the it's different in the Zamora times because he was not successful in season uh, power. He, at the end, um, failed and uh, the two bourgeoises uh, were, ha had an alliance. The, re the agrarian reform didn't uh, occur, but it was under President Chavez who based on Zamorian ideas, he put forward the agrarian uh, reform and he approved the land law, which is actually the trigger of the rebellion against President Chavez in 2002 due to the fishing law, the hydrocarbon laws. These were laws that had not been enacted yet, but they were part of the uh, ability to law. And then the trade bourgeoisie or the hairs of the that uh, trade bourgeoisie represented by Fede Cámaras and represented by Fede Nagas that embodied all the landowners and with the support of the United States and the imperialism, which has already been fully proven, thanks to these forces, the, or due to these forces, the coup d'etat against Chavez was performed. It was reinstated only 48 hours after, and then he started launching the law of land. And then all the expropriation processes started, the confiscation rather process. There are some claims that uh, of some landowners who, who resorted to international tribunals, they were all paid for, for the lands that were seized. And the constitution enshrines the possibility of uh, seizing lands in order to put them at the service of the social uh, welfare and the national prosperity. So yes, we can say that there is a continuity in the three processes, but from different perspectives.
thank you, Pablo, for your considerations and your comments. Let's see what questions do we have now. We started with the questions in Zoom, the relationship with the policy of uh, land and free man policy. And we are also going to share some materials on PDF material. And we also found an English version. And you can download it also. Well, we have no more questions from one of the participants. And the advantage of the chat is that uh, we have been able to, to make comments on, in different seminars. Jave, do you have questions or final comments you would like to make? Um, thank you very much for two uh, excellent presentations. Uh, since um, we are very interested in the uh, land reform in today uh, Venezuela, so uh, we can keep in touch. And also, um, we will uh, organize a uh, uh, conference about the um, the uh, traditional um, medicine in the coming um, uh, the Age South South Forum. Uh, on sustainability. So um, because uh, both um, the land issues and also the um, uh, herbal medicine, traditional, medi uh, traditional medicine uh, are our, our um, uh, entry point to uh, explore how um, a community can um, uh, implement the uh, project of uh, regeneration because um, uh, not only um, uh, the uh, land issue, but all, uh, because uh, in, in Chinese um, context, uh, uh, food production and also should be um, uh, work together with the uh, herb, herbal uh, medicines. Uh, uh, so uh, we think that both uh, land and also uh, medical land land reform and also medical reform actually should be worked together. So we want to explore this uh, issue and then we hope uh, we can uh, work together again. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Thank you, Jay. Very well then. So, yes, we intend to continue the debates on the agrarian uh, reform and the struggles for the land in this seminar and in other spaces as well. By the middle of the year, we will have the next South-South Forum for Sustainability, which is an initiative that the new universe, global university for sustainability has been fostering the people, the, the team who have been uh, with us, they are working on that. So I'm sure that we will pursue the debate. I will now like to give uh, the floor to the speakers so that they can make some closing remarks. I will now give first give the floor to Ali and then to Pablo. And yes, so one more question. Ali or Pablo can answer this question. If uh, you can share a biography in English that uh, is available on the internet. So I will give the floor to Ali. Hernan? Yes, uh, there is uh, considerable uh, sources in English that are available. And uh, I will 
forward it to Hernan and Hernan will forward this uh, bibliography to the university in China and to all of those interested. I think that this topic, the topic of uh, Ezequiel Zamora is an ever relevant topic. And why? Because the communes are also a very relevant topic. The property of the land is a relevant topic. Pablo says that, that the attempt of coup d'etat against Chavez in 2002 was due to the significant amount of uh, laws that Chavez wanted to pass. And at that moment, we had not control of PDVSA yet. PDVSA, up to that moment, was an accomplice and was also like a state within a state. And in order to come social transformations, we needed a financial muscle, otherwise it, it would be impossible to do it. And Chavez understood this very well. Chavez was the first politician in Venezuela that materialized what Alberto Adriani said, attributed to Arturo Pietri, that we needed to sow oil. But the one who really did it was Hugo Chavez. And we can see the result today in more than 3 million housing units under the great housing program in Venezuela. We can see it in the computers being distributed to children at school. We can see them, it in the books also given to the population, to the social uh, programs for the society. I'm very pleased, Hernan. Thank you very much for the invitation and greetings, revolutionary greetings to, to Pablo, to all of you. Pablo, you made a great presentation. And later on, I will send an image where we can see how in 1832, Simon Rodriguez was criticizing the parasitic bourgeoisie of Venezuela as early back as in 1832. I would like, Hernan, if you can share that image so that people can read what's on it. So people following us in different uh, spaces can follow what I say. Technology is wonderful and we're doing this thanks to to it. Here you can see the slide. The businessmen, capitalistic businessmen, are a failure to the industry under the appearance of protection. No one has the right to win but uh, without using its labor. And uh, to do, to make a business counting on the work of other people without engaging his or her interests is the speculation. And he said this in 1832, before Carlos Marx and Engels said it in the Communist Manifesto. Hernan, Pablo, and other partners from different parts of the world, we are at your disposal. I will provide my email account, my Twitter account, and also my email. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Chavez is alive. The, for, the homeland continues. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you for your remar remarks. And uh, I see some comments for, for Pablo. And someone said that Roman Martinez Galindos in his book tells us how Carlos Delgado Chalbot, who is the filmmaker of the film that we shared, 
was very excited when he saw in the French military academies how they cited, quoted the Battle of Santa Ines as an example. And someone asks if we can send more information on that tactic that was used by Samora in, in that battle. So I will give the floor to Pablo for final remarks. Bueno, este, ya, aquí estoy. No soy experto militar. I am not a military expert, but I understand that the Santa Ines battle is an example of a unconventional, non conventional war. of how to use the defensive tactics that are also offensive tactics. Some believe that uh, this tactic of trenches was one of the first ones ever used in a military strategy. I cannot corroborate this, but uh, since the trenches uh, were a characteristic of the first war warfare, we could say that this strategy was before the federal war occurred many years before. We're talking about a rural country, the agrarian Venezuela, and it was a conflict that took place before other agrarian revolutions took place around the world. And uh, the reasons to war, wage war in this case are common to other revolutions, such as the ones led in Mexico or in the United States, where the industrialized North fought against the Southern states, which were in slavery, uh, states. So I think that all this period of the Venezuelan history is very interesting. Historians say that there is much to be studied yet and many more lessons to be drawn that can be useful for the future. Well, I'm very grateful for the invitation. I believe that uh, this uh, analysis of Samora is very relevant in today's Venezuela. And from the agrarian reform perspective, democratization of wealth and uh, the slogan of uh, land and free men, horror to oligarchy, popular election. We can see here all the slogans that are present in the emancipation struggles around the world. And uh, the debate that we have with people from other continents, from different cultures, is very interesting because in the end, we can see common, uh, common characteristics. There are topics that are common to all of us who res which resonate with all of us wherever we might be. For instance, the quotation that was shown uh, by Professor Ali on the topic of the commercial bourgeoisie and the intermediary bourgeoisie that was also very harmful also in the Chinese history when the European empires tried to control China through different mechanisms of negotiation and where there was a trade bourgeoisie that was at the service of the European interests. In Venezuela, we had a similar situation. So here we can see the two common elements, how those bourgeoisies do not contribute to the national development and are an obstacles uh, to the productive forces. And in Venezuela, even though we have approved in, to, in 2001 the, land, uh, the, the law of land, we have made 
progress, but we still have much to do. I think that agrarian reform is not, is not just something that we uh, made possible, but uh, that we need to develop further and analyze it constantly. And I think that it is important also to compare and to reflect not only upon our historical experience, but also about the experience that other countries have had in this regard. So thank you very much again for the invitation. Bueno, gracias a, a well, Pablo y a, thank you, Pablo. And thank you, Ali, for the information you have shared with us. We are thankful to all the team that made this possible. And before closing, I would like to say that Professor Lee shared a fragment on the strategic tactic of the Santa Ines battle. And uh, someone asked to, to deepen on this strategy. I am not an expert on the matter. I am not an expert on the military uh, topic, but I would like to share an anecdote. Over the last 20 years of the Venezuelan revolution, as uh, Pablo said, in 2002, there was a coup d'etat in Venezuela. This was a breaking point in Venezuela in terms of the democratic process that started with the Constitution the Assembly and that came from the movement, popular movement. But uh, that was a very difficult year. There were attacks against the oil company, a massive attack also against uh, the, the population. There was a, a sad attack from the oil sector, a very strong attack against the Bolivarian. And uh, the constituents process of Venezuela achieved to change democracy in Venezuela. And in 2004, a consultation mechanism was activated, which was also fostered by the Bolivarian uh, yes, Revolution, which was the possibility of, um, of making referendums. And you can call for a referendum at the midterm of a tenure of the president. So you can convene a referendum in order to consult the people whether they want the president to continue or not. And in 2004, in Venezuela, we had uh, the first uh, uh, referendum. And also, it was a coup because we felt that this was a uh, attempt to hit the Bolivarian Revolution. We were very sad at the time in 2004. I don't remember very well right now, but the moment approved, or the moment when it was announced as a referendum, President Chavez summoned the people to the palace of, of government, and we went there, and Commander Chavez made a speech, or he prepared a speech in which he described the strategy to go in this referendum. And he said that we were following a strategy similar to the one developed by Samora, which was what he called, what I called a retrograde, uh, retrograde strategy. He famous because he, he, when he was in Barinas, he the trenches. He replied. I mean, he, he allowed the enemy forces to entry. 
and he withdrew. He, he withdrew from the battlefield and the enemy thought they were winning. Then Zamora, who had prepared the a path, he de el recorrido por el cual lo iba a seguir. soldiers flanking that path and he applied what uh, in order to to attack the enemy from the flanks of that pathway because his soldiers were stationed at the end of the pathway. And this is how he won the was inspired by this idea. It was a very sad moment for us because this was a moment where we felt that we were losing. And he said, we are not losing. We are just withdrawing to counterattack more force. And in 2004, we went to revolution referendum and most of the people grassroots, they took, we, we, we took to the ballots and a strategy and we won the referendum, which was an approval referendum in the end because we came out as stronger because we thought it was a setback, but it was not. It was uh, something that allowed us to become stronger. So I just wanted to share this anecdote with you uh, in order to respond to the questions. Uh, we are finishing already. Uh, I would like to thank both of the speakers for this fantastic session. And I would like to thank the interiors as well for the wonderful uh, work they do and permanently translating into Mandarin and translating into English. Thank, thank you also the to two participants that are following through Zoom, through Spec, and oh, I would also like to thank the organizers who made this possible, the Institute Simon Bolivar, our friends from the Leaning Global University for Sustainability and other movements. So see you next uh, meeting next week. We will be addressing the youth, the struggling youth in the Bolivarian revolution, the different histories of our youth that have been fighting in the Bolivarian process. Thank you very much. Greetings to all of you. And since we will prevail.